the signs of the times, the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24 and 25, presented by Pastors Greg and Judy Willis from Timeline Ministries. One thing that people are looking for in this world is hope. For there is no medicine like hope, no incentive so great and no tonic so powerful as the expectation of something better tomorrow. And here we have a picture of the garden tomb in Israel, the place of ultimate hope. When people have a future hope that is real and has substance, it will inspire them to live victoriously in the here and now, and that hope will enable them to cope with the pressures of day-to-day -day living. Sadly, as people look out upon this world, they do not see anything to be hopeful about. The world has gone from one earth-shaking crisis to another. While some may say that we are on the threshold of a brave new world order, others warn that humanity is on the brink of unprecedented disaster, chaos and calamity, and so the hearts of many have become filled with fear and despair, which is a reminder of some words that Jesus spoke in regards to his second coming in Luke 21, 25 and 26. There will be signs in the sun, moon and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. The condition of this world may create fear, despair and terror, but a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ brings hope and the expectation of a wonderful future. This is what the Apostle Peter declared in 1 Peter 1, 3-5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. When our faith is in Jesus, we have a magnificent future and that sure and certain hope is meant to fill our hearts today and overflow to those around us. It is no wonder that the second coming of Jesus is a truth that dominates the New Testament, being mentioned more than any other fundamental doctrine and is taught approximately 318 times in the New Testament. At least 23 of the 27 New Testament books mention the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in some way or another. The question must be asked, is this the generation that will see the return of Jesus Christ? If so, is there any evidence to support such a claim? After all, Bible-believing Christians have been looking for the return of Jesus Christ for hundreds of years. What makes this generation any different to those who have lived since the time of Christ? It was Jesus who spoke these words to the religious leaders of Israel nearly 2,000 years ago in Matthew 16, 2 and 3. When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, Today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Prior to the first coming of Jesus, there were those who were expecting and looking for the coming of their Messiah, and yet many more were blind to the signs of the times that surrounded them. And as Luke 19.44 says, they missed the day of their visitation. Yet Jesus expected them to be able to interpret and understand the signs of the times. Here we are 2,000 years later. The second coming of Jesus Christ is fast approaching, yet most of the world and even the church are blind to the signs of the times which points to the nearness of the Lord's return. If we want to know how close we are to the second coming of Jesus Christ and for God's plans and purposes for this world coming to pass, then we must study Bible prophecy. Other than the book of Revelation... The largest, most important prophetic portion of the New Testament is Matthew 24 and 25, often called the Olivet Discourse, for the teaching was given on the Mount of Olives. It is the second longest message of Jesus recorded in the Scriptures, and an abbreviated and parallel account is also found in Luke 21. It was on the Mount of Olives nearly 2,000 years ago that the disciples of Jesus asked him some prophetic questions which have direct bearing on us, in the 21st century. Matthew 24, 1-3 Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Look! 
You see all these things? he asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The disciples were looking for answers to three questions. One, they wanted to know about the destruction of the Jewish temple, which is answered in more detail in the Gospel of Luke and took place in 70 AD. Two, they wanted to know about signs of the Lord's coming. And three, about signs of the end of this age. Now, significant, momentous events always have signs that people who have eyes to see will truly notice. Take, for example, an earth-shattering tsunami like the one that struck Southeast Asia in December 2004, killing approximately 230,000 people and destroying much infrastructure. Were there any signs to indicate the coming of such an incredible event? The answer is yes. The first indicator that makes one aware of a potential tsunami are signs like this indicating that you are in an area where they are known to occur. A sign like this begins to put you on guard. Another early warning comes from the nearby animals. Many animals sense danger and flee to higher ground before the water arrives. And so if you're in a known tsunami area and you see the animals fleeing, it's a sure sign that you better get to higher ground. A very late sign is when the first part of the tsunami to reach the land is a trough rather than the crest of a wave. The water along the shoreline may recede dramatically, exposing areas that are normally always submerged. Tsunamis have signs that precede them. Likewise, the second coming of Jesus is surrounded by signs that point to his return, and the eyes of faith will not only recognize them, but they will act upon them. Jesus elaborates on those signs. Matthew 24, 4-8 Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Before we look at these signs, we need to note that Jesus called them the beginning of birth pains. This slide gives an overview of Bible prophecy. We are currently in the church age, which will be brought to a close with the sounding of the last trumpet of the church age as the rapture of the church takes place. We then have the final seven years of tribulation that will commence, also known as Daniel's 70th week, and connect us to the events of Revelation 6 through to 18. This period of time is also called the Day of the Lord and is introduced by the early birth pains leading into the more intense labour pains of Jacob's trouble, culminating in the second coming of Jesus to establish his millennial kingdom, which will finally give way to the eternal order of Revelation 21 and 22. This final seven-year period has not yet begun. Though we are living in the shadow of these coming birth pains, the world is experiencing the premature labour pains which points forward to those true labour pains. It was the Apostle Paul who spoke about the day of the Lord commencing with labour pains in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1-3. Now brothers, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. The Greek word used in Matthew and Thessalonians for labour pains is odin, which speaks of the travail and pain of childbirth, which introduces that final seven years of tribulation. As a woman's birth pains become more frequent and more intense as the moment of birth approaches, so it is reasonable to expect all these signs that Jesus spoke about to happen more frequently and with greater intensity as the Lord's return draws near. The other image portrayed through birth pains is that pain will give way to rejoicing for those who persevere. What are the birth pangs? Jesus mentioned a number of distinct signs that point to the nearness of his second coming. 
Deception was the first sign mentioned by Jesus. Now deception has been with us since Satan deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yet in the very last days it will become so widespread as the enemy seeks to seduce the world, people of the world down a pathway of eternal destruction as the spiritual battle in this world reaches a crescendo. Today, over one and a half billion people are deceived and enslaved by the religion of Islam. One billion people are deceived and enslaved by the spirit of Roman Catholicism. Hinduism has 900 million followers. Buddhism, 300 million. 240 million people follow the traditional Chinese beliefs. Voodoo has 60 million followers. Sikhism, 22 million. Taoism, 20 million followers. The Baha'i faith has 6 million followers. And the list goes on. The danger of all this deception is summarized in the following saying. To be in error in religion is to have a cancer in the soul. It can ruin the only life on earth that one has and the eternal one after death. According to Revelation 13, the embodiment of all false prophets will come on the scene during the second half of the tribulation as a beast who arises from the earth with an incredible ability to work supernatural signs and wonders. In Revelation 19.20, this beast is referred to as the false prophet and he will use his deceptive powers to get the world to follow another beast, otherwise called the Antichrist, the one who also performs all sorts of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and both beasts are empowered by the devil himself. Revelation 13, verse 8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. When the church is taken out of the world through the rapture, deception will spread more freely and persuasively than ever throughout that final seven years of tribulation. Not only will deceit be more powerful, but people will also be so lacking in discernment that they will be more vulnerable to the lies than ever. And according to 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11, God in judgment will even send them a strong delusion so that they should believe the lie of the evil one. Secondly, Jesus spoke about wars and rumors of wars and how nation will rise up against nation. Jesus predicted that the subject of war would dominate the global scene. This has certainly been the case from the beginning of the 20th century to today. There have been more wars and war deaths in the last century than in the previous centuries put together. Terms like world wars, genocide, nuclear war have entered into common language throughout the 20th century. And it's been recorded by Patrick Brogan in his book entitled World Conflicts, Why and Where Are They Happening? He states that between 1945 and 1991, there have been 97 wars, 253 coups and revolutions, 199 attempted significant assassinations, of which only 12 failed. And we are constantly seeing on the news wars and violence across the globe. And to further add to the situation of wars and rumours of war, we have the rise of global terrorism. No longer is terrorism limited to a handful of countries, but it is an insidious war that Islam is making upon the whole world. The rise of Islam is also paving the way for other prophecies of war to be fulfilled, in particular the coming Russian Islamic invasion of Israel, which is taught in Ezekiel 38 and 39. The term nation will rise against nation as actually ethnic groups will rise up against other ethnic groups. We've seen the attempted racial genocide in different countries throughout the world and more recently we have the increase of racial tensions across the globe. Even Australia is not exempt from this reality. Ethnic groups are certainly rising up against other ethnic groups. Jesus Christ himself will actually return in the midst of an enormous battle that the Bible calls Armageddon. Now it's interesting to note that the next sign mentioned by Jesus is famine because global conflicts disrupt the production of food. There are other factors that create famine such as drought, natural disasters, decline of land that is suitable for food production and all these causes are on the rise across the globe. And it was the World Health Organization who estimates that one-third of the world is well-fed, one-third is underfed, and one-third is starving. 
Throughout the 1990s, more than 100 million children died from illness and starvation. Every 3.6 seconds, someone dies of hunger and poverty-related conditions. By the time this message is finished, another 667 people will have died of hunger. Fourthly, the King James also lists the signs of pestilence, which are plagues or diseases, and is listed in the parallel passage of Luke 21, verse 11. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Disease and pestilence are killing more people today than they ever have. One child dies of malaria in Africa every 29 seconds. Someone in the world dies of TB every 18 seconds. One person is infected with HIV every 6.4 seconds and is set to become the number three killer of mankind. Epidemics of typhoid, diphtheria and even the Black Death have afflicted areas of India and the former Soviet Union. Deadly new strains of malaria, tuberculosis and cholera are becoming resistant to all known antibiotics and are killing millions of people. The stage is being set for an explosion of pestilence and disease with new plagues in the last 30 years and the return of plagues we once thought were conquered. The World Health Organization declared in 2007 that infectious diseases are spreading faster than ever before, with new diseases emerging at the historically unprecedented rate of one every year. And this map shows emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases from 1996 to the year 2004. Disease is very often connected to natural disasters. For example, in 1931 in China, the Yangtze River flooded, drowning 145,000 and then killing a further 3 million through the famine and disease that followed. It is easy to see how all these signs will snowball as the frequency and intensity of them continue to increase. Then Jesus spoke about earthquakes in various places, and we've seen the absolute devastation that major earthquakes can cause throughout the world. The United States Geological Survey Center has a worldwide monitoring system of the earth with over 150 modern seismic stations distributed globally. They estimate there are several million earthquakes occurring in the world every year. Obviously, the majority of those are minor. They say that earthquakes of magnitude 6 or greater have stayed relatively constant for some time. Though the Bible clearly predicts that the last days will become a time of great seismic activity, as Isaiah 24, 19 and 20 says. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is thoroughly shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. There is coming a time when those earthquakes will multiply greatly as the earth itself continues to groan as it awaits its liberty from bondage. In the parallel passage from Luke 21 verse 11, we read this additional comment about signs from heaven. There will be fearful events and great signs from heaven. These signs could well include asteroids, debris from a comet or similar cosmic dangers. In 1989, the asteroid Castalia passed near the Earth and it was 1.8 kilometers long. Another asteroid called Tertullus passed near the Earth in 1992. There is an asteroid called Apophis that was going to be too close for comfort and scientists originally feared it would strike the Earth. There will come a time where these type of calamities that scientists fear will happen. The prophet Joel spoke about the darkening of the sun and the moon on more than one occasion, and the book of Revelation indicates these signs from heaven will reach epic proportions as the labor pains become more intense. If people are becoming perplexed and apprehensive now at the condition of the world, imagine what it will be like when this final seven years of tribulation truly begins. Today we are only living in the shadow of Daniel's 70th week. The true birth pains are yet to commence in all their intensity. The realities taking place in the world today are only a small foretaste of that which is coming. Jesus continues on speaking about this coming period of time. Matthew 24, 9-14 Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because lawlessness is increased, the love of most will grow cold. 
but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. As this and as this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, then the end will come. Jesus spoke about persecution. Those who come to faith during the tribulation period will pay a tremendous price in terms of suffering and persecution. Being a follower of Jesus has always put one in the midst of a battlefield, yet this last seven-year period will be the climax of the enemy's attempt to destroy the people of God and to establish his rival kingdom as lawlessness runs wild. True believers, we are told, will be hated by all nations. It is a fact that the number of nations where one can openly practice your faith in the Lord Jesus without fear of retribution has been declining for years. There is coming a time where every nation will persecute true believers. The reason for this is elaborated on in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. They are very important verses to understand. At the moment, we live in a time where the reins of lawlessness are being held back. But when the restraining hand of God through the church is withdrawn, wickedness will flourish unhindered. As bad as things are in the world today, it's nothing compared to that which is coming. So why is the Lord allowing this time to come upon the earth? 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit, counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. The people have refused to love the truth. They have refused to take hold of the lifeline that God has been holding out to them. So God will give them over to lawlessness. The next sign is different to all the others. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout all the earth. In the midst of deception, warfare, famine, pestilence, disasters and persecution, the gospel, the good news of God's kingdom is being proclaimed. Satan may seem to be having a heyday, but the Lord Jesus does not leave this world without witness. Noah was a preacher of righteousness right up to the time that God closed the huge door onto the ark. Likewise, throughout the tribulation, the gospel is being preached by both natural and supernatural means. Though the question often becomes, since the true church is raptured before the tribulation, who will take out the gospel of the kingdom? There are the 144,000 Jewish converts in Revelation 7 who are raised up and will proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. There are the two Jewish witnesses who will be given amazing powers to speak God's truth from Jerusalem. And according to Revelation 14, God even sends out an angel from heaven with the everlasting gospel to preach. Yet sadly, all but the remnant will turn a deaf ear to the message. Jesus goes on to give us another incredible sign so that people could recognize the nearness of his return and at the same time connect us once again to Daniel's 70th week, that final seven years of tribulation, Matthew 24, 15 to 22. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of his house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequalled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equalled again. If those days had not been cut short, None would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. 
Jesus said that when you see the abomination that causes desolation as spoken of by the prophet Daniel, then things are really going to hot up in Israel and throughout the world. This is the turning point of the tribulation. Jesus paints this time in the darkest tones possible because the great tribulation is about to begin, the second half of that seven-year period. It will be a period of time that will be absolutely terrible, a period of time also described in Daniel 12 verse 1 and also called Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30 verses 5 to 7 which says this this is what the Lord says cries of fear are heard terror not peace ask and see can a man bear children then why do I see every strong man with his hand on his stomach like a woman in labor every face turned deathly pale how awful that day will be none will be like it it will be a time of trouble for Jacob but he will be saved out of it. The second half of the tribulation, introduced by the abomination of desolation, which Daniel teaches about three times in Daniel 9 verse 27, 11 verse 31 and chapter 12 verse 11, becomes a time of intense labor pains. The word abomination speaks of something that is repulsive, detestable and utterly abhorrent to God. So what is the abomination of desolation? Daniel 9, 24-27 teaches that the final seven years of tribulation begins when Antichrist confirms a peace treaty with Israel. But halfway through that seven-year period, the Antichrist breaks the treaty, goes into a rebuilt Jewish temple, stops the sacrifices and sets up an idol to honor himself, thus declaring himself to be divine from the very place that according to 2 Chronicles 6, 6, that God Almighty chose to bear his name to this world. It is no wonder that Jerusalem is at the center of world controversy. This is exactly what a man named Antiochus Epiphanes did in 168 BC, as taught in the book of Daniel, who is a type or a picture of the coming Antichrist. Never forget that prophetic pictures in the scriptures are often repeated and intensified as the ultimate reality comes to pass. Once again, the shadow of these realities are with us today. Prior to 1948, this prophecy would not have been possible because there was no Israel on the international scene. But since 1948, the following realities have taken place in preparation for the building of another Jewish temple, which will ultimately lead to the abomination of desolation. There is the Sanhedrin, comprising of 71, of 71 scholars, was reinstituted in October 2004 by Orthodox Jews for the first time in over 1900 years in Jerusalem itself. They have their own political agenda, but they certainly have the rebuilding of the temple high on their schedule. In 1997, it was announced that the Holy Half Shekel Fund was to be reintroduced in accordance with Exodus 30, verses 11 to 16. And so each year, Jewish people from all around the world contribute to this fund for the rebuilding of the temple. It has been claimed that the foundations of the Second Temple have been located by Professor Kufman, a Scottish Jew. He and others believe the previous temple stood about 100 metres north of the Dome of the Rock. The peace treaty that Antichrist introduces may well allow for the rebuilding of a Jewish temple with the current mosque remaining intact. The ashes of a pure red heifer, according to Numbers 19, are needed for the rededication of a temple, and such an animal has been bred. The priesthood has been trained. Many of the vessels for the temple have been fashioned, the priest's clothing made, and so it will only be a matter of time before a temple is rebuilt, paving the way for this momentous sign of the Lord's coming. It was Daniel who spoke about the abomination of desolation three times, two and a half thousand years ago. It was then Jesus who put that event into a certain time frame. And we live in the shadow of that reality today. For nearly 1900 years, this, nine was, this sign was not to be seen, but we are the generation seeing it come to pass. The question becomes, in the midst of widespread deception and global disturbances, how can the true Christ, the true Messiah, be distinguished from all of the counterfeits? Well, Jesus continued on with these words in Matthew 24, 27 to 30. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. 
Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The second coming of Jesus will be universally visible and dramatically obvious to one and all. The culmination of the tribulation is the return of Jesus Christ in all glory and power to set up his glorious kingdom for 1,000 years as he reigns from Jerusalem before he establishes the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal order of Revelation 21 and 22. That is why the analogy of birth pains is used of that last seven-year period, just as a woman must go through the agony of labor to bring a new life into this world, so this world must go through the agony of labor pains before a new era or age is birthed. Matthew 24, verse 31 And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. We must note that the second coming of Jesus is distinct to the rapture of the church. The rapture happens in the blink of an eye and brings great hope and comfort when Jesus, accompanied by an archangel, comes for his bride, the church, and we meet him in the air prior to that final seven years of tribulation. The second coming is seen by the whole world, bringing judgment and wrath as Jesus returns to the earth at the conclusion of that seven-year period. So we must ask, who are these being gathered with a loud or great trumpet call at the end of the Great Tribulation? The great or loud trumpet of Matthew 24:31 is not a reference to the rapture of the church, which takes place at the sounding of the last trumpet. The great or loud trumpet is different to the last trumpet. The only other mention of a great or loud trumpet in the scriptures is found in Isaiah 27, 12 and 13, which is a reference to a final regathering of Israel who are also called God's elect. That final regathering of Israel, God's elect, will take place at the sounding of the great or loud trumpet at the end of that tribulation period. Now some people may comment and say that these signs could continue to increase and become more frequent and intense for many more years to come. Is there anything else that really sets this generation apart? Well, the Olivet Discourse goes on to give what one could call a validating sign, a sign that confirms or substantiates the other signs, a sign that has been touched on with the abomination of desolation, but fully brought out in the teaching of the fig tree in Matthew 24, 32 to 35. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Some would say the parable is simply saying that by looking at a fig tree and its budding, one can tell that summer is near. Likewise, the generation that sees these signs come to pass will know with certainty that Christ's return is near. Now, I don't dispute that. But is this simply a parable about a fig tree or is there more to it? Is there another layer to its meaning? The clear answer is yes. According to Hosea 9 verse 10, Joel 1 verse 7 and Luke 13 6 to 9, the fig tree is a picture of Israel. The day before Jesus gave this teaching on the Mount of Olives, he actually cursed a fig tree as recorded in three of the four Gospels. The fig tree had a lot of leaves, but no fruit. Jesus did that to illustrate God's judgment upon the nation of Israel. They had a lot of leaves, but no godly fruit. They had a lot of show and pretense, but they lacked the heart righteousness that God was looking for. And so the tree, after being cursed by Jesus, withered away to its roots. From God's perspective, the nation was being judged, but the roots were still alive and awaiting the day when they would sprout forth again. Jesus uses the definite article when speaking about the fig tree. He doesn't just say a fig tree, he's talking about a specific fig tree. The disciples knew what fig tree Jesus was talking about. Their minds would have immediately gone back to the fig tree that Jesus had cursed the day before. 
as soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Before the return of Messiah, the fig tree would begin to bud and bloom again. The fig tree began to blossom on May the 14th, 1948, when God miraculously brought Israel back from the graveyard of the nations where she had lain since 70 AD and was re-established as the homeland of the Jewish people. In Luke 21, 29 to 31, this little comment is added. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. Since the fig tree is Israel, what are all the other trees? They are other nations that have come to life from around the same time as Israel. The United Nations commenced in 1945 with 52 nations. But over the last 60 odd years, we've seen an incredible period of, na of great national resurgence. Colonialism has been cast off and country after country has fought for its independence and nationhood. Today, around 200 nations take their place in the world community. Is it a coincidence that all these nations have sprung up on the international scene around the same time as Israel, the fig tree? Not at all. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus was teaching that when you see a great increase in false messiahs, wars and rumours of wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilence, along with events taking place with Israel amongst all the nations of the world, then you can know that his return is near. Jesus could not return until Israel was once again on the international scene. And today no one doubts the existence of Israel. She stands firmly at the heart of world politics and debate. We need to remember that Israel is not just a cold clinical sign. Israel is God's heart laid bare on the international scene. The existence of Israel reveals to us the faithfulness of God to his promises. Current day Israel is a reminder of God's eternal love for that nation and people. Israel speaks of the long suffering of God. If we want to understand the fullness of God's heart, then we need a love and a respect for Israel and the Jewish people. The remainder of the Olivet Discourse focuses on the coming judgment and the need for people to be prepared. There is a day of accountability which is fast approaching for this world. The teaching of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse makes it abundantly clear that his second coming is surrounded by many birth pang signs and we live in the shadow of all those realities today. The signs come as a package. And when that whole package is present, then you know that the second coming of Jesus Christ is fast approaching, giving great evidence that this is the generation that will see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Oh, should I should